Hello. So my name is Eric Brandsberg. I'm the CTO of Heimdall Data. Before we actually go into the content for today, I want to talk about a few, well, what, what's a, what will we go over? Uh, what Heimdall does is it sits as an abstraction layer between applications and database. But instead of diving into what we do, I'm going to talk about the lessons learned and the issues that we found in rolling a caching layer uh, between the application and database. And I'll talk about some of the hints and tricks that we actually implemented within Heimdall in order to improve the solution uh, for everybody. Uh, this is relevant if you want to try to roll your own cache into in a similar way, but not using Heimdall. Because there are cases where Heimdall isn't necessarily going to be able to provide you with what you need. Uh, once I'm done talking about that, I'm going to talk about our solution a little bit. And then I'm going to go into a live demo of what we've done and uh, do Q uh, questions and answers after that. But before we begin on the content, a couple of quotes. First, we can solve any problem by introducing an extra layer of indirection. OK? So I'm sure you guys as developers have added layers of uh, API calls into something to try to hide the complexity of the problem that you're actually dealing with. The question I have, though, is what layer of indirection do you have between your application and the database? OK, there's really no standard way to add a layer there without rolling something yourself. Heimdall tries to come in and solve that problem for you. Second, premature optimization is the root of all evil, or at least most of it. Again, talking about how developers work and code uh, solutions, often you want to make sure that everything works first, get it feature, uh, at least minimally complete, and then worry about optimizing. We're trying to take one difficult area of optimization and solve it for you. And by the time I go through this, hopefully you'll understand caching, uh, in many cases, isn't as easy as it looks at the very top when you start looking at it. Next, there are uh, only two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. We're not going to try to solve the second part for you. We're here to talk about the first part. Often this is quoted with a third uh, problem, and that is off by one errors. But I think that got dropped. And finally, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. General management uh, philosophy that you have to be able to figure out if you're doing things right before you can make things better. OK? So going to our main topic here today of scaling right master clusters, what are the features that are easiest to use that actually provide you with the capability of doing that? And there are two parts here. One is caching. And that is, don't allow the database to ever even deal with a query, because it doesn't have to. If, it's, if you know the answer already at another layer, serve it from that other layer and leave the database be. Uh, we're going to be talking about in, that in detail. The second one is something that a lot of people aren't as or, uh, aware of. And that is a concept called read-write split. Conceptually, it's opening up two connections, one to your primary write database and one to a read-only node. And then your application can decide whether or not to use the read node or the read write node. It sounds really simple, OK, to code and to deal with. The reality is there are gotchas that can cause problems later. But if you take both of these together, you can very easily scale out your database quite a bit more than if you don't use these features at all. OK. So let's talk about caching first. You can roll your own, but really, realistically, should you? OK, caching is simple in concept. 
you create a key based on the content that you're requesting. Okay, you can just hash the query, the SQL query. Next, you basically serialize the result that you get from the database. You throw it into some data store somewhere. And then whenever you have another request, you just check if it's in your data store first, right? It's not that hard. Okay, why shouldn't you roll your own? Well, you're gonna get into problems. What happens if the data in the back end changes? Well, now you have to know which objects were affected by that change, and you're gonna have to invalidate those. Uh, oh, you're going against a cache, let's say a Redis cache is your primary database, great. Well, what, a, what if you're only getting a 50% cache hit rate? Well, the misses could be costing you more than you're saving and you could actually be slowing down the performance on your system. It becomes very important to have a good high cache hit rate in order to actually get benefits out of that. Uh, are you over caching objects? If you just keep pushing everything in, then you may end up overflowing memory and there are objects that you should have kept in because they would have been useful, but because you shove everything in, you're not gonna get that benefit anymore. It just costs resources and you're not getting the benefit. There's security issues on the caching as well, okay? Who has access to the data? If Joe and Fred both have uh, logins onto the database, well, should Joe have access to Fred's data? These are all the complexities that end up becoming real issues as you go through and build a database or build a cache. So let's talk briefly about invalidation, uh, which is removing a cached object that may have been changed for, for in the source of truth. Very difficult problem to deal with, one of the hardest in computer science. What we have done at Heimdall is we look at the table that the query is being, data that's being written to, and we use basically the table as an identifier of this set of data is categorized by this. Now, instead of invalidating all the objects, which can actually take time, you don't want to walk through all the objects and say, well, I wrote to table A, so I need to get rid of every table or every object associated with table A. Instead, you just say, I wrote to table A at X time. And if you're in a distributed system via, say, Redis pub sub interfaces, you can send a simple timestamp message out saying table A was written at this time. Now, whenever an object is pulled from the cache, you just check the time and you keep, as part of the cache entry, the tables that were associated with that object. The net result is you can throw it out when you re retrieve it and repopulate it immediately. You don't have to walk the tree of all the objects that are actually in your cache. That takes a lot of time, that's a very expensive, you don't wanna do that. So here, Redis provides a nice facility both for storing the data in the cache and for notifying everybody that may be participating that a particular group of objects have been invalidated. You just need, now need to keep track of that on every node and you're good. Okay, any questions or thoughts on this? Okay. Oh, uh, so yes, that, that's what Redis provides there. The next trick is about latency. You know how I mentioned the uh, cache misses are a critical issue? Uh, well, Redis actually provides a very interesting piece of functionality uh, for uh, key space notifications. When an object goes into the cache, via the PubSub interface, you can receive notice that that key was added. It also allows you to know when they've been removed or changed. So the idea here is to have the goal to never have a cache miss against your cache. Track locally the keys that are in the cache, do a simple lookup to see whether or not it's gonna be a cache hit or not. If not, go straight to the database or if, it, if it's gonna be a cache miss, then you just never actually ask the cache. You retrieve it from the database, you put it into the cache and you're good, okay? So this is a very useful piece of functionality that allows you to know 
up in advance where to get the data. And as a result, you never take the penalty for the cache hit. Yes, question over here. Here, let me. So wouldn't, you're gonna be tracking the keys in the cache and then you're checking the cache to determine whether you should go to the database or not? That no. Return? Oh, okay. Okay. So the point here is that you know if it's going to be a miss. If it's gonna be a miss, you never ask Redis. You go to the database, pull it in, and you never take the round trip to actually go to the Redis database. Redis is telling you, as your little local cache, I have objects A, B, and C. If you want D, don't ask me, okay? That way you get rid of a complete round trip to the database nodes. It never has to figure out whether it's there or not because you knew already. And this is actually something that I wanna talk very briefly about. I've seen in many cases people ignoring the fact that round trips to your cache can be very expensive. I've seen suggestions of doing things like using Redis for a throttling of data by keeping track of a counter, an atomic counter in Redis. A better way to do that, instead of doing a round trip every time to figure out if it's going too fast or not, is to effectively negotiate a rate per node that each node is allowed to operate at you can still use Redis to coordinate that, but use the throttling, uh, use that throttle and resynchronize it maybe once a second. So node A, B, and C can each negotiate that they should have a particular percentage of your total throughput. Don't go to Redis every request. It'll slow you down. Any questions on that point? Okay. Next, uh, selective caching, more can be less. Uh, if you have large objects that are being pulled from the database, a gigabyte of records, whatever, it's pretty obvious. You shouldn't necessarily throw that into the cache. But when you get into smaller object sizes, that, that can become very, very questionable. Uh, you want logic that will analyze your actual benefit that you're getting out of caching to ensure at worst you're never getting making things worse by caching but ideally you're optimizing only for the the beneficial queries uh, in our case we look at the tables that are being accessed we look at how often they're being updated how often uh, dml operations are writing against them uh, you can also look at query patterns uh, we boil the queries down into uh, an individual pattern with all parameters removed, and we keep statistics against that. We then automatically take all these statistics and we determine, is it worth this pattern or this table to be cached? If not, we don't ever send anything to the database or to, to Redis. We don't serialize, we don't take any penalties for that. And we automatically adjust that. This is the type of thing that ideally within an application is done for all intent and purposes automatically so that you as programmers don't have to look at individual queries or data access in order to figure out, should I do this? It should be automated for you. Uh, so a variety of hints here. Obviously these slides are gonna be available off, offline so uh, we'll uh, skip some of that. Uh, security. Obviously, big issue, who should have access to data? Uh, the query alone often does not provide enough information for you to determine whether or not someone accessing data should be allowed. Okay, within Heimdall, we attach the user by default that is requesting the data as part of the cache key. Now, in an application server environment where there's literally one user, eh, okay. Not a big deal. That is a fairly frequent uh, use case. But if users actually have access to the data, this really becomes uh, a sensitive topic. So you need to pay attention to that when you're de designing a cache subsystem as well. 
uh, if you have availability of other information that goes into uh, towards the security model, uh, users from the web front end side. You could actually include that as, say, a comment within your SQL query so that you know who it should have been, and then we can use that as part of the uniqueness for a cache key. And if you're rolling your own, you can do the same thing. Uh, you also need to watch out for potential issues. Uh, there have been a lot of serialization problems or security issues, in particular with Java, but pretty much every language has had problems with this where if you're not conscientious of how the data is serialized, you could end up having problems with how the data gets pulled back in, and as a result, what code gets executed. Read up on uh, vulnerabilities for any libraries that you're using for that. Okay, so that's briefly on the caching part. Let's talk about read-write split. Now, this is something that a lot of people haven't done, or it, it's not done as much as versus just trying to cache into Redis. But the concept here is you've got two database nodes. You want to be able to send some queries to your read-only node. Again, sounds simple. Biggest problem here is replication lag. How many of you have ever dealt with trying to send queries to multiple databases and you've dealt with replication lag causing results that you didn't expect. <laughs> okay, a couple of you in here have. Others may not have realized they have if they've tried doing this. But, for example, SQL Server can take upwards of one second for data that was committed on one node to actually show up on the other node. If you do a write and then an immediate read, you're gonna get the wrong data if, it went, if you read from the other server. So as a programmer, you may be like, I'm not gonna try to figure this out then, and you just read everything from the right server. What you can do is do what we call replication lag detection, where you're actually writing things to the database periodically and seeing how long it takes to show up on the reader. Uh, and then uh, we also have a fixed lag window that you can add to anything we detect. But what the, the idea is, if you have an immediate read and or write then read, you're going to do both from the write server. If you wait two seconds between the write then the read, you can then use the read server. Okay. And again, this should be programmed as an abstraction layer so that you, as the programmers, don't have to deal with this. Okay, you've got enough on your plates just working, worrying about the functionality. Keep it simple at the layer that you're writing features at and move on. Okay, uh, so talking about the uh, uh, read-write split. Okay, uh, now the interesting thing is that read-write split and caching actually come together as functionality. They're, they they, they're, they live together. The thing is, to do read-write split properly, you need to know when writes happen to tables across your infrastructure. That, in caching terms, is when the table was invalidated. So if you're tracking invalidation for caching anyway, you have the most important piece of information that you need for read-write split. But the interesting part is it solves a, pro a problem for two different sets of queries. One set of queries is wh where you're doing repetition against the data and the data is not actually changing. The other set may have a function, for example, uh, a SQL value of now, which always talks about the current time. That's a non-deterministic function. It's always changing. A query cannot be cached, by default at least, that has non-deterministic functions. But you can send those queries to the read-only server as long as you know what tables you're dealing with. Okay, so there are two different sets of queries. Using both functions, you can then provide a significant improvement in scalability. Any questions on this so far? 
Okay? Now, here's how Heimdall has worked to solve this problem. Instead of trying to develop yet another API layer that everybody's ended up having to write to at some point, oh, don't use JDBC, use Hibernate. Don't use Hibernate, use something else. We say, we don't care what libraries you use because we're not gonna operate at the library level. We don't care what language you're gonna use. We implemented this at the binary database protocol level and we can still sit as a piece of software on your application server, so you could literally be talking to local hosts as if we're the database. With this, we can implement the caching. We act as a traffic cop to determine what content should be served from Redis or uh, cached into Redis. We act as a gatekeeper on what uh, queries should be sent to the read-only server. We act as the gatekeeper for what writes are happening and we coordinate through the Redis pub sub interface to do all the invalidations. Uh, we also have a lot of other features. Now I'm gonna come back to this slide in a little bit uh, to talk about those other features, but what I wanna do is go into uh, what we're doing, okay? Uh, this is an example of caching and read write split being uh, functional for a single application. We implemented Heimdall to operate on a rule system. So instead of trying to code to all these different rules, we allow you to change the rules literally at runtime. It can, you can change the behavior as needed. You can figure out exactly what works, what doesn't. You don't have to compile. You don't have to redeploy your applications or anything. And what we see here is with those two rules uh, enabled, the reader eligible and then the cache rule, we see this behavior here. We're getting the cache hit, which is upwards of 90% uh, at that, within the, this period. But you can also see on the queries per second here that the blue line showing that the reader is taking traffic. So anything that wasn't in the cache, it's pulling from the reader. If I actually let this go long enough, almost nothing would come from the reader because it all went to the cache. But these are deterministic queries and they're all cacheable. Any questions on uh, anything so far? Uh, yes. Okay, so the question is, what do we use to determine uh, when it's safe to do the, the reads from the read server? What type of information do we track? Uh, first off, we, within our system, we have a DML threshold or cutoff percentage. By default, unless 95% of access against the table are reads, we will consider a table non-cacheable. If even one out of 20 operations is a, a write, we're gonna be like, eh, you know what, it's not worth it, we're not gonna get involved. Uh, that's adjustable, however, and you can make it to the point where we're gonna try caching all the time, we don't care. Uh, the second part is that we boil down the queries to a pattern. So we remove the actual variables and we track the uh, actual hit percentage on, each, on that query pattern and then we also look at the performance for that pattern from the database compared with the performance from the cache engine. If the cache engine is not beating the database, we won't cache it. Okay, and we learn that over time. So as a result, if you're not getting a benefit, we're gonna stop, okay? And there's a little bit more secret sauce that goes into that as well, but uh, that's, that's a high level uh, perspective. Okay, now another perspective to look at things is we can work with old programs that you're not gonna be updating to include cash. Third party programs, you can put us in and get a benefit anyway. Redis, however, is a good data store for new development Okay, we complement each other because it's two different pieces. We can automate a lot 
of what can be automated. And then from there, you can do anything that, remain, that remains. Going back to premature optimization is the root of all evil. If we can do it, that means you don't have to worry about that part. Okay, just go on to the other stuff. Okay, now what I'd like to do is very quickly, I'm gonna do a live demo. Hopefully the internet doesn't give out, <laughs> okay? And I'm gonna show you the types of benefits that caching can offer uh, completely as an automated uh, service. So I'm gonna come here, give me a moment. That's not what I wanted. Uh, actually, here's the Heimdall Data Console. Now, as I had mentioned, everything is rule driven. So I'm gonna go to this uh, set of rules. Let me, uh, make that a little bit bigger. Okay, these are rules for an application called Udo, which is, I think, a Python-based uh, application. Uh, we're using an e-commerce data set for it, and I've got it set up so that there's a, a traffic gener generator in the background pushing traffic. Now I'm gonna come over here on our live dashboard, and at the moment, we have caching enabled for this. So you can see that what we're getting is about 1,000 queries per second on this particular thing. It, it's kind of a small application node, but almost 100% cache hit rate. Now, let's see what happens when I turn off caching. Remember, we were getting about 1,000 queries per second before. I'm gonna turn off caching without having to restart the application, which is itself kind of nice. You can play around with the rules and see what happens. And what we find is that the application went from about 1,000 queries per second down to less than 500, probably closer to 400, okay? If you don't have to write any code and you can get that type of performance improvement off your database, that sounds nice, okay? Now, the other point is we have read-write split enabled. Once the cache stopped, Read-write split kicked in, so we're still protecting the uh, write server on that database cluster. Okay, it didn't have to eat the load. It was another device that had to eat the load. Okay, and when you, once you can move to pushing that load onto read-only nodes, it's a lot easier to scale your database. <laughs> okay. Yes, question from the back. Yeah. Um, what about uh, nested queries, uh, which covers two or three uh, different tables? Okay. Is it applicable for your system, or it's, it's something different? Okay. So the question being, what if you have a nested query? Let's say it's joining three tables. Uh, our system will know that all three tables were involved we look at the most recent invalidation time out of those three, and we use that to determine whether an object has been invalidated. Now, this means that if you're joining a whole bunch of static tables and then one that's really dynamic, it means you're not gonna get cache hits out of that. Now, depending on how everything is set up, we have rules that allow you to override invalidation. So, for example, it may be safe to say, well, five minutes stale for this is fine. Okay, eventual consistency effectively. But that's up to you. You can apply all these different rules in order to deal with whatever the corner case is. Or, and this is where the opportunity of, you know Redis is available. That's a corner case that we were not able to automatically cache. If you as a developer say, fine, we're not prematurely optimizing, it's actually causing a problem, you can, work around that by pushing that into Redis and taking over for that query. All the others that were simple queries or that were being handled appropriately, you don't have to worry about. It limits the scope of your optimization significantly. Okay. So we've got the queries per second there. Oh, any other questions on this? It's just a, a continuation of the uh, earlier question. So okay. the, the nested code is. 
So still I'm not very clear about the nested or well, it's a feasible in your system? Uh, yes, it is feasible, but the complexity of the queries and what data is being merged becomes an issue. Uh, you may be merging uh, a table of an address, zip code, whatever, stuff that's not actually changing a whole lot. In that case, you can cache the result as long as it's repetitive. You're ask, asking the same information over and over again. If, however, you're doing a merge against a transaction table that's constantly being updated, then that means that any query that came from that table that's constantly being updated will also constantly be invalidated. So you're not gonna get cash hits out of it. So it really depends on what it is. In an e-commerce environment like this, where uh, you have pages that are based, are being built based on data that's within the database itself, you can get a huge cash hit rate. And there's a lot of applications that behave this way. Think of it as we're caching the, all the lookup tables and then maybe some other stuff. That's most of what the database access is. Okay? Don't prematurely optimize though. You can put us in. And in fact, one of the interesting things here, it'll take a moment for this to come up. You can go through and use our analytics to find out what we were able to optimize and then you can go from there to figure out, okay, should I optimize this other stuff? Or I, I'm not gonna suggest this from a business perspective. You could use this to say, well, if Heimdall was able to optimize and cache this content, we can just go in and get rid of them, but use the information <laughs> that they uh, provided me. This was clearly cacheable, so eh, let's just cache it. Uh, but you can see here, like what we do, is we present what the query patterns are. As I said, we remove the uh, parameters within the query patterns. And then we track the DB usage ratio. So you can say, see that, for, that one query at the top took 17% of the time on the database. So that could potentially be worth optimizing and trying to figure out why is it happening so often and why is it not cacheable. But if we go a little further down, you can see this query pattern was taking 0.6% of the database time. It's not worth bothering with that one. Okay, so the analytics are a great tool for figuring out what's going on, where the database latency is coming from, how is it uh, piling up within your application, and you go from there. Uh, we also have the capability of extracting, for example, uh, query plans. And let me find one that's not quite so simple. Okay, so we can pop that out. We see the overall statistics for it. We see a nicely formatted uh, SQL query. And then you can see what the uh, MySQL execution plan is for that query. And we'll, by default, when we have this configured, we'll pull that once an hour for a given query pattern. And it gives you a little bit more of a historical perspective of what the query plans were over time. Okay. Any questions on that? Great questions. Stored procedures. And I'm going to take one step further and also include database of views. Same type of idea. The actual query does not tell you what is happening uh, at the database level. This does add complexity. And the answer is it depends. <laughs> OK. On SQL Server, we have coded logic that actually digs into the stored procedure logic. And as long as you're not using dynamic SQL within that stored procedure, we can generally figure out what tables are being read from, what are being written to, and we can even build nested uh, dependency tables so that if one stored procedure is called from another, we know that. Okay? We can also do that uh, view support for uh, SQL Server. On Postgres, we don't have the stored procedure logic in place, but you can flag stored procedures manually on our, through our rule logic and say, these tables are involved. 
Uh, in Postgres, though, we do have view support to say this view is inter interacting with these tables. So if you write to one table, we know how to propagate it back up through the views. On MySQL, we support the view, the view logic if you're using MySQL version 8, because certain things that were added in uh, for version 8. But if it's version 5, uh, whatever version of 5, then even the views aren't currently parsed out. Okay, so great question. It depends. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay. Uh, Have you explored multi-master write with this? Have you explored multi-write master with this? Okay, yes. Uh, the question is, can we support multi-write master? And actually, we already have support for multi-write master. Uh, we actually do load balancing as well. And in fact, this is what I was going to this, the, uh, uh, here we go. Uh, we have the ability to do multi-write master. If, if, if it's supported by the database, we can spread those writes out. If you're talking about something like a Galera cluster, uh, by default, however, we'll nominate one server to be a write master and we'll treat the others as read-only nodes. And the reason why we do that is because there are contentions that can happen when you're trying to do multi-write masters and if the application isn't actually designed to handle those exceptions and do retries and such, then it can cause the application to break. We're trying to take the best of both worlds where if there's a failure on one write master, we know we can just start writing to another master. There's no orchestration that's necessary. It's a very simple, very easy to use. And that's a very powerful feature out of multi-write master databases. We by default use it in a way that's a little bit more compatible than a true write master. But if you want, and your application will deal with it, go for it. We'll handle that. Okay? How many nodes uh, do you guys support if you have more than one uh, read-only node? Uh, question, uh, how many nodes do we support as read-only nodes? And the answer is, I don't know, memory limit. 5,000, 10,000, <laughs> I mean, there are gonna be resource constraints based on the connections and everything else, but we don't have any hard limit that says you can only do four, okay? And we can spread it out and then you can do weighted round robin to those nodes so they don't even necessarily have to have the same capacity. We can still balance it out proportionally based on what they are allowed to handle, okay? Some other features that we have uh, a really interesting one is batch processing. Uh, most databases are not very effective in uh, doing DML singleton inserts. As a result, a lot of programmers spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to batch uh, data loads into a database. What we have is the capability of actually taking multiple DML operations that are coming in a very short period of time putting them into a, trans a, a batch transaction together, committing it together, and if any one of them has an exception, we deal with the exception back to the front end connection or we log it depending on how it's set up. And you can get an order of 20 times or higher DML performance improvement by using this functionality. And this is something that we've been working with the uh, Green Plum uh, team at Pivotal on uh, because they particularly are impacted by this with the nature of their uh, multi-processing architecture. So this helps performance improvement dramatically. Uh, we can also do query routing. The read-write split is simply a very particular case of taking a query and sending it somewhere else. We can do that in a generic sense so that you don't even have to have it as part of a cluster. We could say if it's a query against this table, send it over here. We don't care, okay? So it's a bit more flexible there as well. 
uh, load balancing, uh, transformation. You can edit the SQL on the fly if you really wanted to. I'm not gonna recommend you do this all the time, but if you've got a bug within your SQL statement and you don't wanna have to re roll out a new version of the code, you can just edit it here, change it and say, programmers fix it the, <laughs> with your next rev. And we have had customers doing that. Uh, we also do connection pooling and connection muxing. Uh, this is a feature that we, in, uh, uh, we had looked at, uh, if you're in the Postgres world, uh, something called PG Bouncer. Uh, quite important in order to reduce the number of Postgres connections because each connection is a very heavyweight, uses a fair amount of resources on Postgres. This allows you to take a very large number of connections and issue the uh, queries against a very small pool of queries or uh, connections. So we can do that as well. And the whole point is we're trying to build an abstraction layer so that you guys don't have to do this work. Okay, now you can just access the data just like you would if you were building a really small single server install and you don't, you want the, the glorious days of you not having to worry about scalability. We try to make it simpler for you so that you can continue working that way and it actually won't break. Any questions? So I had a question around, uh, uh, you know, the Redis throughput when the size of the object that you store in Redis, you know, goes up. So obviously, you are using query result sets, right? And if you go through the Redis documentation, one of the uh, uh, recommendations is that, you know, as your size goes up over 1 MB, then the throughput goes down from a million to, I think it was down to 50,000. So can you please talk about, you know, uh, if you have any experience, you know, with these things? Oh, yes. Great question, uh, dealing with the Redis throughput. Uh, we're generally dealing with transactional type environments that have relatively small object sizes. But what we also have is a tiered architecture we, where we store the hottest content in heap in the way it will flow onto the wire to go back to the application, effectively serialized in the database's own native format. So as a result of that, few uh, we reduce the load on Redis to deal with large objects. And almost the, the entire load that we're dealing with is pushing data into Redis. It's only if we do a cold start of a new node that Redis is gonna have a lot of data pulled out of it. But the reality is that the object size problem isn't specific to Redis. It's the database as well. So wherever you get the data from is gonna have this problem. But we support clustered Redis as well. So, I mean, you can cluster out and spread the load out on multiple uh, Redis nodes. Okay, w one more question. Yes, uh, does it need Redis to function or can we just use the read write split functionality? Okay, in order to use the read write split functionality, if you have more than one Heimdall node, you'll need something as a pub-sub interface. Now, while we're here at Redis, I can talk about Redis and Elasticash. There are other vendors we support as well. But you will need an interface to talk that invalidation logic to say a write happened at this point in time and uh, share that information across all the nodes. If you have exactly one node of Heimdall, you don't need an extra cache. Yeah, uh, this question relates to uh, batch processing. Okay, so the batch processing is when we're taking many DMLs, wrapping them in a single transaction together, committing them together so that you amortize the commit overhead over many uh, DML operations instead of just one. Okay, but we behave in a way so that most of the time you can't even tell it's happening. Do you have an interface for batch processing? As you are showing uh, a slide for uh, analytics. So is the same way you have a batch processing interface? Uh, the question, do we have a batch processing interface? It's all configured through the rules so that you can specify what queries will get batched together. You can even create multiple batch interfaces, batch queues that are independent. You can flag it so that 
we automatically create a queue based on a table name, based on what the DML is touching. So you could say if it's going against table A, it's gonna be part of batch uh, queue A. If table B, it'll be batch queue B. Uh, but there's no other interface aside from like the dashboard does show when you're doing the async operations, which are the batch operations. But, yep. Okay, thank you everybody for, for attending. And if you have any more questions, I'll be at our booth downstairs.